I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 through verse 3. These verses are so powerful to me. I, it, you know, we've read these verses before, but I want to read them again today as a, as a way of, of, of leading us into the topic that we will share. And I think it will be a blessing to us. Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2. And I actually want to read through verse 4. I plan to only read through verse 3, but I want to read through verse 4. And, and it says this, All the commandments which I command thee this day shall ye observe to do, that ye may live and multiply, and go in and possess the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness, to humble thee and to prove thee, and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with the manna which thou knewest not, and neither did thy fathers know that, the, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment wax not old upon thee, neither did thy foot swell these 40 years. Can we all say amen? amen. I want to um, call to your attention verse 2, verse 3. He says, he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knowest not, neither did thy fathers know, that he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord. For a topic today, we want to speak on the topic, God's word will get you through it. Amen. God's word will get you through it. Our passage is found in the book of Deuteronomy, and, and, and the word Deuteronomy actually means second law. It is called the second law because it is the second writing or the utterance of, of, of a law that was previously given. Because there are individuals living during this time that were not alive when the first law was declared. And a brand new generation was rising up who did not know God's providence, God's blessings, and they didn't know God's law. They didn't see God split the Red Sea. They didn't see God come down on Mount Sinai. They knew nothing about who this God, their forefathers, was speaking of. And because Moses was Israel's teacher, he showed Israel how to live in God's world and how to do it God's way. He was a prophet among a many men and women. But he was different because he was a teacher and he was a leader of the people. He was revered by the Jews and, and also respected by the Greeks, which we call Gentiles. And the Jews would, would look at him and say he was considered probably one of the most important and imposing figures that Judaism has ever seen. And even those Jews who didn't necessarily, or rather those Greeks that didn't necessarily follow Moses, they understood him to be a very special figure because they saw the law that he gave Israel and they respected the moral law that he represented. They saw and heard of, should I say, the, the great deliverance that he led Israel through. And for that reason, they often associated him with magic and divine wisdom and astrology. And some would even say that he was such a, of a heroic figure that he should at least be respected, even if they wouldn't follow him. You see, there are many people in the world, we may not follow them, but we can respect them. We can respect them because of the things they've done in the world. We can respect them because of the stance that they took. And we can recognize their ability to lead well, even if we don't find their beliefs agreeable. This is how the Greeks looked at Moses. They looked at him and said, this man led a nation out of slavery and brought them to the point where they would inherit their own land. I want you to think about how amazing that is because slavery is hard enough to get out on your own. But here is a man whom the Bible said he walked an entire nation out of slavery. He liberated them. If he was living today, he would have easily gained what some might call the Nobel Peace Prize. He would have easily gained it because we see individuals like Martin Luther King and, and some of the other prominent figures who simply fought for freedom. Their fight didn't necessarily accomplish what they intended to accomplish, but the fact that they actually fought for something, that they stood for something, it warranted them to be recognized by the Nobel Peace Prize. And here it is, a man, Moses, 
not only fights for something, but he actually accomplishes something. He takes a nation without a sword, without any weapons, and he tells them, get your stuff ready. We are about to leave Egypt. I want you to imagine what that would have looked like. Imagine a man, a, a man, a single man with a rod in his hand. He looks at 500,000, a million people, and say, I know we've been in slavery for 40 years, for 400 years, excuse me, but God said, we're about to leave now. Get your clothes, get your food, go to the Egyptians and take their spoils, and we're going to get up out of here because God showed me a land that we're going to inherit. This man was a revolutionary. He was a liberator. But the question that I ask when I think about Moses is what did he see? What was motivating him? How could a man, a single man, a man who was, by the way, one that we would say had low self-esteem, when God came to him, he told him, Moses, you are the one that is going to lead Israel out of Egypt. And what did Moses say? Moses looked at him and said, God, you must have the wrong person. God, you know I can't speak. God told him to go to Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh that he was going to free the people out of the hand of the Egyptians. And, and God said, Lord, why don't you get my brother because at least he can talk. And God looked at him and said, who made the mouth? Can I tell you something? When God wants to do something with you, he doesn't need your excuses. Can I get an amen for somebody? He don't need you to tell him why he can't do with you what he said he's going to do. God looked at him and said, who made your mouth? He says, don't you know I formed your mouth and I can speak through you? He said, but just because you have a, a self complex, I'm going to call your brother Aaron to walk along, alongside you. And to Pharaoh, you should be God. And to Pharaoh, Aaron should be prophet. And he says, I'm going to allow you all to literally come out of Egypt. There was something that he saw. I like to call it sight. I like to call it faith. Because faith changes the way you look at things. You see, Moses saw something that distinguishes followers from leaders. He saw something that distinguishes revolutionaries from people who would just settle for the status quo. He had the ability to see the world as it currently was, and he also had the ability to see the world as it possibly could exist. You see, faith is not dismissing the reality, but faith is accepting the reality and then turning that reality into something that you can't see right now, but you know can be much better than it is right now. Faith is accepting the, it's, it's a lot of what I like to call the tension of, of sitting in between uh, the, the, the present and the future. You understand that, yes, I am sick, but I won't always be sick forever. Yes, I'm broke, but I won't always be broke forever. And faith puts you in the middle of that and says what is right now won't always be. Can I get an amen for somebody? Amen. amen. There is a man by the name of uh, Shimon Perez. He passed away in 2016 after struggling, amen, from a stroke. And Shimon Perez was the president of Israel. He was a respected uh, a leader across the entire world. He was the, 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 the leader of God's, amen, state, the state of Israel. And upon his passing, they had many different rulers and dignitaries that came to Jerusalem to pay their respect. Among some of those were Barack Obama and Prince Charles of England and Pope Francis. All of them came to Israel to pay their respect. And whenever people analyzed his life, they looked at him and said, President President Perez, he, he worked tirelessly. He was, he was a, tire, a tired worker, if you will, a tired servant, because he extended himself for the state of Israel. And in fact, he was one of the very first politicians or one of the only politicians left that saw Israel back in 1948 when they became a state. He was one of the first people to pioneer some of the policies and some of the things that would lead Israel into the supposed independence his legacy was one of peace and love he was known for one that wanted to spread peace and love everywhere and among everybody and in fact whenever the uh, islamic amen uh, people came against israel he was the one negotiating peace saying that we are the closest neighbors amen among any in the rest of the world and soon our goal will be to become friends you see the hostility that existed between the israelis and the arabs he was there negotiating peace and love because he said his God was a God of peace. It took courage. It took him seeing something, standing up for something. And when people asked him, what motivated you? and What drove you to do that? Have such courage. He said these words, I just kept dreaming. I just kept on dreaming. I looked at the world and I understood the world was not what God wanted it to be. 
but I allowed God to keep me at a point where I could continue the dream. Let me just say something here today. Hey Amen. I don't care how bad it is. Always have the ability to see past what's happening right now. Look at your moments of hostility and your moments of, of fear and your moments, amen, of discouragement. And say to yourself, God has given me the ability to dream. I was sitting here and I was thinking about that statement. He said, I believe that God can make the world a better place. I dreamed of the day when God will make the world a better place. Bishop Dale Bronner, one time when I asked him, I was walking him to one of the uh, buildings, through one of the buildings at our school. And I asked him, I said, if you could tell a young preacher anything that would help him along his way, what would it be? He said, expose yourself to many things. Expose yourself to different environments because if you can dream, your faith can be developed from what you are seeing. In other words, he said, don't let anyone, don't let anything in life diminish your ability to hope for a better day. This man fought because he believed as bad as it is, amen, God can make things better. How many of y'all believe that here today? Amen. That God can make things better. And this is what I believe Moses had. We call it faith, but faith is not always defined. Faith is saying, I know what's right now, but I believe that God can do better. There's a revelation that goes with faith. I believe Moses was a seer. He was a dreamer. And more importantly, I believe that he had the revelation that gave him the ability to have faith and to have hope. I believe he saw the world as a better place. And more importantly, I believe he saw the world, catch this, before Adam's fall. You see, Moses was the one that God spoke to and let him see how the world existed before there was sin. And if you remember, God gave him the book of Genesis to write and give to the people of Israel. And in the book of Genesis, the Bible describes Adam, who was this figure, this first priestly king figure in the Bible. He was a priest and he was a king, if you will. But that doesn't say that days before the fall were always perfect. I want you to see, understand it today. Just because we got saved, it doesn't mean that everything will always be perfect. There's a song that says, I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some, some rainy days. But at the end of the song, it says, I won't complain. And how many of y'all can say today, you won't complain? Yeah, things are not what it has always been, but the Bible tells us that we don't have a reason to complain because God is always good to us. There are four things that defines Adam's life. The first thing is that though things were clear and precise, and even though God had brought order to this order, in the back of the world's mind, they can always see the fragments, the, the aroma. They can smell the aroma of a, a, of a world that was chaotic and dark. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God created heaven and the earth, and the, and the, and the world was dark. God's spirit, in verse 2, sat upon the face of the, of the waters. It was chaos. It was disorderly. And even though things have been pulled into order in God's creation, you can imagine Adam looking around and saying, I can see where that was pulled into place. And this might have been differently based on what existed before God's uh, moving in the earth. And there was a slight reminder of that. And that is the presence of Satan, the serpent in the garden. The serpent was slithering in the garden. Here he is in the midst of the trees, in the midst of Adam and Eve, he's slithering through the garden. He's trying to find his way. He's trying to find a way to get into the hearts of men. And even though God gave them the ability to not have, uh, be overthrown by Satan, Satan thought he would find an occasion. He thought he would find an opportunity. And he did. He found it in Eve. And it shows us that even in what we would call or define a perfect world, the enemy was existing. Can I get an amen for somebody? Satan was there. He was there trying his best to overthrow God's plan. But the third thing that I, I recognized in the world before the fall was that man had to work. Hey Amen. I was thinking about it the other day. I said, you know what? And we often say this. If Adam wouldn't have fallen, we wouldn't have to work. But that's not true. The Bible shows us that before man fell, he was given a job. Can I get an amen for somebody? The job was to keep and guard the garden which means that God gave him responsibility even in a perfect world. That means we would have to do something even if we weren't subjected to sin and death. But the fourth thing is what I love about this, because the fourth thing that we find is that though man had to work, all of his physical needs were supernaturally provided by God, which means, brothers and sisters, 
God didn't allow man to work for food, but he still had to work. Can I get an amen for somebody? He wasn't working for clothes. He wasn't working for a place to live, but God gave him, amen, a job to do. But the moment Adam fell, the world changed, amen. The world became chaotic again. And there were two responsibilities, one for God and one for man. And man's responsibility, they had the responsibility of now working by the sweat of their brow. The ground had been frustrated. God had allowed thorns and thistles to grow out of the ground. And the Bible says that God told Adam, by the sweat of your brow, which means it's an idiom to say, by hard work and labor, you're going to earn your bread. Meaning you're going to work all your life. And this is what he says. You're going to do this until you return to the ground. Can I get an amen for somebody? You ever felt like you were working your life away? Amen. All, every time you turn around, you're just trying to get a little bit to get, get into, your, into your, in your house, kind of get a little bit more to have more food. And, and now the gas prices are up and now the inflation is up. And it seemed like I got a raise, but now the inflation took the money from my raise. You see, we are always striving and working. And what I want you to see here today is that God has given us a way to live above the curse. God has given us a way to live above the curse. You see, God took Abraham and birthed out of Abraham a nation called the nation of Israel. And he told the nation of Israel, I'm going to give you a land that's like the Garden of Eden. Except I'm not going to call it the Garden of Eden. I'm going to call it the promised land. And in the promised land, there's a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm going to go before you and prepare the way. Yes, the Jebusites are there, just like Satan was in the garden. The Jebusites are there. The Canaanites are there. The Hittites are there. But don't worry. I'm going to go before you. I'm sending my angel before you. He's going to take care of all the things that are oppressing you. And he's going to make sure you have an opportunity to stay in that land. But just remember, there are three things you got to do. The first thing he tells them is you have to follow me. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1, he says, I want you to carefully obey. Carefully, he says, obey or observe everything that I told you you ought to do. Because I'm going to change what your responsibility is. Before you have the work to gain a living, but I've already taken care of that for you. The Bible says that the elders went over to the Canaan, the land of Canaan, and when they came back, they came back with grapes on poles. I mean, they were carrying them two by two, grapes on poles, fruit so big that they had to carry them in unison. Don't you worry about, could you imagine, could you imagine a man not going to work because you need food, but going to work because you're doing something for God? Could you imagine where all your needs are taken care of, not because, amen, you make such and such a dollars, but because God is supernaturally providing for you. This is what it means in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the what? Kingdom of God and his what? Righteousness. What is God saying there? God is saying to them, don't work for your own care. I'm going to take care of that. Change your motives and work for the kingdom of God. Can I get amen for somebody? Hallelujah. He's saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cause you to live above the curse. You see, there's a such thing as living above the curse. The first thing he tells them to do is follow me. But then the second thing he tells them to do is remember me. Remember me. I, I was listening, amen, to Tony Evans on the way here. And Tony Evans said this. He says, he says, it's easily, it's easy to forget God when you fail to remember what he's done for you already. It, it's easy to forget God when you, whenever you easily forget what he's done for you in the past. And one of the things that God constantly told, amen, Israel to do, when you get over in that land, don't you forget me. When you see all those gods, you see, here's the thing that's interesting about this. God said, I'm going, to, I'm going to go over there and go before you. But what he did is he allowed some people to stay there. And why did he do that? He did it because in verse 2 he says, I want you to remember me, and I'm going to take you through this wilderness experience so it can humble you and prove you, and so it can show what is in your heart. I want you to ask yourself this question. If God gave me everything I'm asking him for, would my heart be able to handle it? Can I get an amen for somebody? Amen. If God gave me every prayer I ever asked for, I was looking, there's this movie, amen, this man, he, he, he's, uh, he, he's playing God in the movie, amen, and he has these prayers that are coming in because, you know, God hears all prayers at all times and everywhere, and what he was showing is that people were praying and praying, and because he had a finite mind and he had a limitation, he was just basically answering all the prayers, yes, 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 and whenever he walked outside, the world was falling apart. 
houses were being borne down and people were robbing and stealing and taking from one another because people's prayers are always expressions of the status of their heart. And sometimes our heart is not worth the prayers that we pray. Can I get amen for somebody? Amen. And he says this, I took you through the wilderness. May I suggest to you here today, sometimes we were broke because God was trying to teach us a lesson. Can I get amen for somebody? Sometimes we didn't have life the way we wanted it because God, as it says in verse two, he wanted to humble us and prove us and help us stay in his word. And so he tells them in verse three, I humbled you. I suffered you to be hungry so you can know what it means to be fed by God. Have anybody ever been fed by God here today? Amen. Sometimes you look at I remember a preacher. He said this. He said, I came all the way down from Philadelphia. I had I remember the amount of money, but it was the equivalent to about, let's say if he was living in today's world, he would have had about 50 bucks in his pocket. He said, I had about six or seven, like six or seven kids. I took my family because God told me to come down here and I drove all the way down here with fifty dollars, all our stuff and all of our family in this station wagon. Got down here. And by the time he reached South Carolina, he had no more money. And he said he was sitting at his table after preaching a service. And watching, amen, the repo man come and literally drag his car to the yard while he was preaching. He was sitting at his table and he said, Lord, I have no food. I have nothing in that refrigerator. I have nothing in those cabinets. And I don't have any money in my pocket. He says, but I know you sent me down here. And I'm asking you, Lord, to make a way for me. He says, as soon as he finished praying that prayer, he heard a knock at the door. He went to the door and there was a woman there he never saw in his life. She had never seen him. And he said, uh, the lady said to him, said, sir, I don't know you. You don't know me. But God told me to drop these groceries off to your house. And it said in that moment from that blessing, amen, the, the story goes and says that he took that food and fed his family for that night. You see, what I want you to see here today, sometimes God lets us go through things, through things so he can show us how good of a God he really is to us. Amen. That's why he's telling Israel. He said, I'll let you get hungry so I could feed you. I let you get hungry, not so you can try to feed yourself. I let you get hungry so you can see what it means to be supernaturally fed by God. And I'm going to say this to us here today. Some of us have to learn to be dependent on God. Can I get amen for somebody? Amen. Some of us got to learn. Amen. We can't do it on our own. We can't, we can't do it by our own strength. We got to learn that if it wasn't for the help of God, none of us would be here today. And so he says, I'll let you go hungry so that you can. Here's the third point. So you can learn. So you can learn. He said, now you got to follow me. You got to remember me. But now you got to learn from me. He says, when you have this capacity to follow me and remember me and learn from me, now you can focus your mind on doing the work that glorifies my name. I dream of the day and I'm not there yet. I will confess. But I dream of the day when I can go to work and not worry about my work paying for my family. Can I get an amen for somebody? I know I know we got to work, but but sometimes what we're working for is out of the will of God. Can I get a man for somebody? Amen. Because God said, I will take care of your needs. You busy yourself doing my business. But the sin of man, the sin of this world has called us to live and accept the curse. What I want to invite you today to understand that God has called you to live outside of that curse. Amen. God has sent his son. To give you a life, catch this, as it says in John chapter 10, verse 10, a life of full abundance. That is a life that is never ending. And that life is the kind of life that God has intended for all of us to live. Not a life of death and sorrow. You see, the reason why death is so powerful is not because it happens in an instant, but it happens from the moment you start breathing. The moment you start breathing is the moment death begins. It is a subtle, amen, conqueror. It takes away the best of you. It takes away your opportunity to do what God wants you to do. It takes away your strength, takes away your focus, takes away your drive, takes away your commitment. And God said, I never created you to be a, a victim of death. I created you to live. Can I get a man for somebody to live more abundantly? What does it mean to live? It means to live in the purpose of God. It means to live in the will of God. It means to live in the kingdom of God under the rule of God so that you can be a carrier of light in this world filled with darkness. Take this message and tell people by your works and by your life what it means to live for God. I often think about Brother Faison and Brother, Brother Edie, and I think about you, Brother Brown. 
Oh, you guys are retired. Brother Brown, you're not retired. You, you're working with me. So we, we're going to keep on moving a little bit. But you guys are retired. I think you're retired, but I don't know. Maybe you're not retired. But Brother Faison is retired. And I think about, I was thinking about this morning. I said to myself, most people retire to relax. Can I get an amen for somebody? Most people retire to relax. I mean, I often tell people when I know that they're retired, I can't wait to get where you are because I want to do what you're doing. But if you understand what it means to be a human in God's good creation, you will understand that if you are a human in God's good creation, you never stop working. And the idea that we're going to go to heaven and sit down and do nothing is a myth. Because the Bible says that we're going to go and sit before his throne and catch this word, we're going to serve. Can I get an amen for somebody? Which means even in eternity, you will be serving. You will be serving. The only difference is you will serve not for the saint for the fact of taking care of yourself you're going to serve and worship in honor of God why don't we start now can I get a man for somebody why don't we go ahead and practice now why don't we serve God now so we'll be prepared for heaven we'll know what we're supposed to do when we get there this is what the Bible is telling us he says Israel I didn't call you to work for food I didn't call you to work for your clothes in fact he says this in verse 4 for 40 years your raiment didn't wax old, and your feet didn't swell. I was thinking about the other day. My wife might, might disagree with me, and I'm done. But I buy clothes because I have to. I don't buy clothes because I just want to. I don't just walk into a, short, a, a store and say, you know what, I'm going to buy me a shirt today. I was thinking about it just, just this weekend. I have shirts that I've worn for at least four years. And I'll keep wearing them because they ain't torn up. I don't buy clothes just because... I want to have clothes. I buy clothes because I got to wear something for work or I got to have a certain presentation. But, but I don't just walk in the store and just buy clothes. There are a pair of shorts that I have, my wife would tell you, that I had from, I don't know, I might have been 2008. Those shorts are probably 10 years old. But let me tell you something about God. Why does God do these kind of things? He does this because he wants to show us he can take care of us. We worry about Things that don't matter. And living in a world that is cursed by sin will have you thinking about things that are not your responsibility. It was never our responsibility to take care of ourselves. Sin did that to us. But how many of y'all can say today, you're out of sin? Hallelujah. You are free. <laughs> you are free and you are alive in Christ. So guess what? What is now was a responsibility of yours is now God's responsibility. What is God saying to us? Don't sit back and relax. Change what you're working for. Can I get an amen for somebody? Change what you're working for. And store up treasures in heaven as Jesus taught. And he says, your reward will be great in heaven. How many of y'all want to have a great reward here today? Amen. amen. God is telling us, amen, he has freed us from this curse that has been put on us by Adam. And I want to just say here today, that don't just mean you're free and you get to go to heaven. That means life is all different now. This is what Paul means when he says, if any man be in Christ, he is a what? New creature. All things are what? Passed away. Behold, all things become new. This is the newness that God has given us. And it starts here on earth, and it takes us into heaven eternity. I thank God for you today. I thought, hope you've been blessed. I hope you will be challenged today in every way to live above that curse that, God put, that Adam put upon us when he fell in that garden. See in the word of God your new responsibility in God and live in it like Jesus did when he was on this earth. Do you notice that Jesus didn't worry about anything but doing the will of the Father? He says, my will is not to eat. This is why he, he told Satan in, in Matthew chapter 4. He says, man does not live by bread alone, but by the word that proceeded out of the mouth of the Lord. That's not his way of saying, amen, that I'm, I'm, I don't have to worry about food. That's his way of saying, Satan... You're trying to get me to work on a, in a way that doesn't align with what God wants. I don't live by that bread. I live by the word that comes out of God's mouth. Stop trying to get me to do things that God doesn't want. Can I get an amen for somebody? Stop trying to get me to eat bread that God doesn't want me to speak into existence. Stop trying to make me do things that are not in the will of God. That's not my bread. My bread is what the Lord tells me to do. Can I get an amen for somebody? And when you do what the Lord tells you to do, the Bible says blessings just keep coming keeps coming from every direction. I pray today as we go into this week that you find blessings on every side. And I pray that you remember those blessings are not just for you. They're for somebody else too. Can I get an amen for somebody? 
That's what I pray upon your life. Let's all stand and ask the Lord's blessing. I made it in less than 30 minutes. Can I get an amen for somebody? <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> I told you I was going to keep my word. All right. We thank God for you. I pray that you have a blessed week. I'm just happy that the Lord has blessed us. I, I believe God is so good and he is worthy of our praise. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you today for all of your goodness. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word being alive today. Thank you for, for the freedom and the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ for freeing us from sin, taking off of us the power of death and the power of Satan that was imposed on us by the fall of Adam. He, he did something to us that we all wish he would have never done. But I thank you today, Lord God, that through Jesus Christ, we have been freed from the power of sin and death. We've been called to live in the beauty of holiness. We've been called to live in the kingdom of God. I thank you for the power of Jesus Christ that breaks the yoke of Satan. I thank you, Lord God, for the blood of Jesus that purifies us from our sins and give us a right to be in the family of God. And because you are our Father, Lord God, we know that all things work together for the good of those who are called according to the purpose of God, who love the Lord and are called according to your purpose. I thank you, Lord God, that you are great. I thank you, Lord God, that you are awesome. I thank you, Lord God, that you are powerful. And that there is nothing that can overthrow you. I ask you today, Lord, as we go into this week, make this week prosperous. Make it, Lord God, victorious. Make it productive, Lord God. Help us to have victory on every side and allow your power to rule through us. Let the world know that the kingdom has come and that you are truly in charge of all that is happening in this world. Lord, we ask you for your guidance, for your spirit to lead us. Overflow, Lord God, our lives with your presence. And allow us, Lord God, to have this testimony that we are children of God by the blood of Jesus Christ and that we belong, oh God, to you and that you have called the world back to yourself. I thank you, Lord God, for your power. Thank you for all you will do through us and in us in this week. It's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Let us all say amen.